Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And I'll continue to read. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged or comforted together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but I was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to the Greeks and barbarians, both to wise and unwise. For as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek or the Gentile. For in it... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. Yeah, amen. There's so much in this great book of Romans. I was privileged when I first began to teach in churches under the covering of a pastor. The pastor assigned me the book of Romans. <laughs> he, he had started, he, he used to teach a Sunday school class in the back room of the Canton restaurant on Sunday mornings. Uh, his theory was that sometimes new Christians would be more comfortable going off-site uh, rather than a church setting, you know. So he asked me to come over and join that class. We had two adult classes. There was one in here, and I'd sit right there. And, uh, but he, the pastor asked me to come over and join him in that one that he was teaching at Canton. So I'd go over there and... and uh, I, I didn't know it. He was trying to groom me to be something, you know, to teach. And uh, so he, he started the book of Romans, and when he got into the third chapter, the next Sunday he says, Dave, uh, it's yours next week, chapter 3. And I, okay, okay. I can, you know, I can do that. But he turned it over to me, the, re the rest of the book of Romans. I thought I was going to teach one chapter. <laughs> And so I, I had the privilege of teaching the remainder of Romans to that group of young Christians. And uh, uh, I, I really fell in love with the book of Romans then. It's such a powerful book. And I'm going to read some things that others have said about it in the past. We'll recognize some of the names. And then we'll go back to the text and, and look at some things more closely. We've all heard of St. Augustine or St. Augustine, depends on your pronunciation. Uh, in the summer of 386, a young man wept in the backyard of a friend. He knew his life of sin and rebellion against God had left him empty and feeling dead. But he just couldn't find the strength to make a final, real decision for Jesus Christ. As he sat, he heard children playing a game, and they called out to each other, each other, uh, these words, take up and read, take up and read. Thinking God had a message to him in the words of the children, he picked up a scroll laying nearby and began to read, not reveling, in, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, but in, not in quarreling and jealousy, uh, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, to gratify its desires. 
He didn't read any further. He didn't have to. Through the power of God's word, Augustine gained uh, the faith to give his whole life to Jesus Christ at that moment. The impact of Romans on Martin Luther. In August of 1513, a monk lectured on the book of Psalms to his seminary students, but his inner life was nothing but turmoil. In his studies, he, became, he came across Psalm 31.1, In thy righteousness deliver me. The passage confused Luther. How could God's righteousness do anything but condemn him to hell as righteous punishment for his sins? Luther kept on thinking about Romans 1.17, which says, The righteousness of God is revealed through faith, uh, for faith, as it is written. Uh, he who through faith is righteous shall live. Luther the monk went on to say, Night and day I lay and pondered until I grasped the truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby, through grace and sheer mercy, he justifies us by faith. Therefore I felt myself to be reborn and have gone through open doors into paradise. This passage of Paul became to me a gateway into heaven. Martin Luther was born again and the Reformation began in his heart. John Wesley, in May of 1738, a failed minister and missionary. It's interesting, I'd studied some about John Wesley before. We used to go to another church, Free Methodist. And uh, he, he was a traveling preacher and he came to America from England and he rode horseback and he'd go, go throughout the New England states preaching the gospel. But he wasn't saved himself. He was preaching, he, was, he believed what he was preaching, but he wasn't converted yet. And, and so, you know, he was a powerful guy, powerful preacher. So then uh, he said he went to a small Bible study back in England where someone read aloud from Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. As Wesley, the failed missionary, said later, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt that I did trust in Christ, in Christ alone for my salvation, and assurance was given me that he had taken my sins away, even mine. John Wesley was saved that night in London. Consider the testimony of these men regarding Romans. Martin Luther praised Romans. It is the chief part of the New Testament and the perfect gospel, the absolute epitome of the gospel. Luther's successor, Philip Melanchthon, Melanchthon called Romans the compendium of Christian doctrine. In other words, in one book, it's all contained right there. John Calvin said the book of Romans, when anyone understands this epistle, he has a passage open to him to understanding the whole of Scripture. That's true, I think. Samuel Coleridge, an English poet and literary critic, and Paul said Paul's letter uh, to the Romans is the most profound work in existence. Frederick Godet, a 19th century Swiss theologian, called the book of Romans the cathedral of the Christian faith. G. Campbell Morgan, and if you've been studying much at all, you'll recognize some of these names. These are great names in history. G. Campbell Morgan said Romans was the most pessimistic page of literature upon which your eyes ever rested, and at the same time the most optimistic poem to which your heart, which your ears have ever listened. Richard Lenski wrote that the book of Romans is beyond question the most dynamic of all the New Testament letters, even as it was written at the climax of Paul's apostolic career. We should also remember the Apostle Peter's words about Paul's letters. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom, wisdom given to him, has written to you as he did in all of his epistles or letters, in which are some things hard to understand. Can we say amen at that about Paul's writings? Sometimes he's a little bit over our heads, amen? amen? But not completely because we can't understand. The book of Romans has life-changing truth, but it must be approached with effort and determination to understand what the Holy Spirit said through the Apostle Paul. And uh, I, I want to scroll through my notes here because I couldn't print them out. Uh, so important. Okay, right here. In all of Paul's letters, uh, most of them are to the church or the churches. 
And then the pastoral letters, First and Second Timothy and Titus, are written to young pastors, Timothy and Titus, about the pastoral ministry in churches. But the book of Romans, the most em emphasis is on God himself. 153 times in Romans, uh, an average of once every 46 words, this is more frequently than any other New Testament book God has mentioned. In comparison, note the frequency of the other words used in Romans. Law, 72 times. Christ, 65. Sin, 48. Lord, 43. And faith, 40. Romans deals with many different themes, but as much as a book can be, it's a book about God. Amen. Amen. So let's continue on. We'll go back and, and read. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And I know I elaborate on this every time I come across the word, but it bears uh, reviewing. A bond servant is based on the Old Testament concept that during the year of Jubilee that Jews uh, that had been slaves could be set free. But sometimes uh, a slave didn't want to be set free. They, 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 they love their master. It's not like their slavery is always brutal. And so a, a slave could opt out and say, I don't want to be set free. I'll stay with you. And he would go into a covenant with, a, with his slave owner where the, the owner would put his earlobe against the doorpost and then take an ice pick or an awl, A-W-L, and pierce through that ear. And then that's a blood covenant now between the owner and the slave. And the slave is a willing slave for the rest of his life, his or her. Willing, not coerced, not forced to be a slave. So in a sense, no, no more a slave, a bond slave, a willing slave. And that's what the apostles call themselves based on that concept. A bond slave or a bond servant to Jesus Christ. A willing servant. Called to be an apostle, which simply means one who is set out, but the foundational apostles were special. We know that. Separated to the gospel of God. The gospel of God is, you know, the good news about Jesus Christ. And so God took Paul. We, we read about his testimony on the road to Damascus. Got his attention. Knocked him to the ground. Blinded him. Sent him to another man who had prayed over him so he regained his sight. And now he had met Jesus personally and he was a changed guy. It says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Jesus said it, the other writers of Scripture say it, uh, that Moses and the prophets all spoke about Jesus. Not necessarily by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, but only Jesus of Nazareth could fulfill all those, those prophecies. So, <clears throat> to which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Right here in two verses now we see the dual nature of Jesus Christ clearly outlined. His, his human nature is through the line of David, the human reproductive uh, facilities through the line of David. So that's his humanity. Verse 4, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. His resurrection from the dead is proof that he was deity or divinity. So the dual nature of Jesus Christ. He was human and he was fully God. He never lost any aspect of either one of his natures. He became that. Sometimes he set, his, uh, <clears throat> he, he set aside his, his God nature to be in submission to the Father's will and the Holy Spirit on earth as an example for us. Excuse me. <clears throat> Verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Now Paul's saying the apostleship there is specifically referencing himself, Peter, and the rest of the guys. But you and I can be called an apostle in a secondary sense because the literal meaning is one who is sent out. All of us sitting here are set out with the gospel. We're sent out one way or another. We're, we may not be evangelistic like Billy Graham or some of the big name evangelists. Or you might not have a title being a pastor or whatever. But you, you and I, all of us, were sent out with 
the good news about Jesus Christ to, to an ambassador to speak it and to live it yes. in front of people. And not to be a bunch of holy Joes and making ourselves like we're more spiritual than everybody else. That's a turnoff, folks. I'm telling you that. But it's just being naturally holy. Naturally sold out to the Lord. Uh, and Paul says, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Now he turns to the people in Rome, not just apostles. He says, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. You know what saint means? It means basically set apart unto God. But you know, if portions of the church have made sainthood to be something that God never meant for it to be. Yeah. Everyone who ever accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is a saint. Amen. The moment we make that decision, the moment we're born again, we are saints. Because God takes us and he sets us apart unto himself. Amen. It's a spiritual setting apart, conducted in the heavenlies and in our heart. We are set apart for him. We're saints. Amen. And uh, I used to ask the question, how many here think you're righteous? And some people raise their hands. Some people go kind of this. They're not sure. And how many are saints? Uh, you know, we're not sure about that. The Bible says you're a saint. If you're yeah. born again, you're a saint. If you're born again, you're righteous. Yeah. You have the righteousness of God. It says that. And so we have to take what the Bible says seriously about our relationship with him. I think too many of us, and I'm including myself in this, sometimes we live in defeat and not in victory. Amen. And that doesn't mean wishful thinking or, or that we can speak certain things into existence. It just means that we have a settled faith in our, my relationship, our relationship with Jesus Christ, based on what the Word of God factually says about that relationship. It's a beautiful thing once we grasp it Amen. and hang in there with it. Continue to implement 1 John 1, 9 as we walk with Jesus. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. Sometimes he adds mercy, but without grace, mer mercy doesn't appear. So grace and peace. Grace meaning we get this great salvation and we don't deserve it. Amen. We deserve punishment. Because we're sinners to the core. But we're changed inside out by the Holy Spirit of God. And now we're walking by faith. And we're implementing 1 John 1, 1.9 in our, our daily prayer life. And uh, Grace you in peace from God our Father. We should have peace in our hearts regardless of our circumstances. Amen. Amen. You know, the world is always looking for fun and happiness. And those are temporary experiences they are based on emotion or whatever and emotions change up and down but joy and peace they're settled things they come to us from God only and so in the middle of a turmoil in the middle of a crisis we can have peace yes. and understanding God's grace at least at least a little bit and that brings us peace it's number one peace with God because when we sin, we sin first and foremost against God himself. Amen. He's the only perfect being in the universe. So when we sin, we sin against him. But he's forgiven all of our sins through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. They were nailed to the cross. We sang the, the lyrics to that song. It's based on, on a, at least part of uh, Colossians chapter 3. You can read that in the New Testament. Nailed to the cross. Yes. The ordinances that were against us were nailed to the cross. So that means what Jesus affected on the cross, all those sins were overcome and forgiven by God. First, I thank, for, uh, I thank God through Jesus Christ for y'all. Verse 8, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention to you always in my prayers. Paul Travel a lot. We, you know, we've been talking about that. He's most traveled of all the apostles. And so he, he visited a lot of churches, helped establish some, came in and, and, and bolstered the ministry and some of those others. But every one of those churches that he was involved with, he prayed for them consistently. 
in Rome. He hadn't been to Rome yet. And, uh, of course, we, we left off in the books of, book of Acts, and he's, he's in Rome at that point uh, in his own apartment. And, uh, but, but the gospel had already come to Rome. Rome, in Paul's day, was about a million population, so it was a very important city. And, uh, of course, the emperors were in charge, but while the Romans did a lot of bad things, they did a lot of good things in, in a physical sense. Uh, they had a good, good road system and so on, and... Uh, so it, it made possible for the gospel to be spread because of the ability to, you know, they, they walked most of the places. But they had good roads to walk on and so on, so they could spread the gospel. Anyway, Rome was well evangelized. And some think that Peter went to Rome and he founded the church there. Well, no, the church was founded in Jerusalem, Israel, on the day of Pentecost, as recorded in Acts chapter 2. But somebody got over there, and we know that on the, Acts chapter 2, there's a whole list of people from different parts of the Mediterranean area that were in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. Well, some were from Rome. Some were from Italy. So, so we know that the gospel had already been in, about Jesus Christ and his resurrection in Rome before uh, Paul or the other apostles got there. Uh, in fact, I think Aquila and Priscilla, Paul met later, they were from Rome, if you'll remember that. They were solid, grounded Christians when Paul met them. Paul says, I pray for you always. Verse 10, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. That, that should always be the qualifier in every decision we make. Is it in fact God's will? Sometimes we're not sure, amen? amen. Sometimes we have this pulling or this sense or this feel and there's nothing wrong with that. But we've got to make sure that it's not just our emotion and something we want to do, some drive that we have, and not God's will. Amen. Because you may have the drive, and you may accomplish a lot of things with, with your effort. We see that in the secular world. They can accomplish a lot of things apart from God. Yes. But as a Christian, we want to always be in God's will. And sometimes that takes a, a lot of prayer and a lot of uh, submitting to God for Him to speak to us about those things. Yes. It's serious. It really is. But we can rejoice in this. We belong to him. We're saved. Yes, Whatever he has for us, he, he'll, he'll unfold that to us as we're faithful to him, uh, reading his word, church fellowship, etc. Okay. Uh, for I long to see you, verse 11, that I may impart uh, to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. So he's going to come along and he's going to help uh, what they've already been uh, taught and establish that in, in a little deeper way, perhaps. That is, verse 12, that I may be encouraged or comforted together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. That's, that's amazing. Where, where Paul doesn't hold himself higher than they, even though he has a higher office. He's selected by Jesus Christ to be a, a foundational apostle. That's a high office. But Paul doesn't regard himself as higher. He, he'll make statements that sound almost like he's bragging, like, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That blows me away. Yes, you and I can imitate Paul as he imitates Christ. Can, can we, do we believe that? Look around. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think we sell... The Lord short for sure, but we sell ourselves in our relationship with him as children short at times as well. And Paul says that I may be encouraged together with you by our mutual faith. He drew, he drew strength from Joe Average Christian sitting in the pew, for an example. So together, we're in this together. And those guys have already gone, but we're in it together with them. What they, what they were in it for and their purpose, we're in it together with them. We're following their instruction as God had them write the scriptures. I do not want you to be unaware, verse 13, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I'm a debtor, both to Greeks 
and the barbarians, both the wise and unwise, or the foolish. He's a debtor. He, he, he feels that he owes them something in our mutual love for Jesus Christ. And he, he makes this statement, which would, would cover all, all the groups of people. Uh, he doesn't specifically say the Jews here, but he includes them elsewhere. He says, uh, I'm a debtor both the Greeks and to barbarians, both the wise and unwise, or foolish. Uh, one of the writers uh, of commentary said, barbarians here doesn't mean barbarians in the sense that there were barbaric types of tribes of people that were just vicious and, uh, and they were killers. Barbarians here means just simply unbelievers. They, they, they don't believe in, in, in Jesus or the gospel. So they're barbarians in that sense that they're, they're in a state of unbelief. But he says, I'm a debtor to both because barbarians were coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, Greeks uh, were, were coming to Jesus Christ. You know, there, there were a lot of Greek-speaking Jewish people that didn't speak Hebrew. Uh, they were called Hellen Hellenists, but they were believers. And so Paul says, I'm a debtor to, to both. The, and to the wise and unwise, or the foolish. So much is in, in me, verse 15, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. And I love these two verses. And sometimes when I get timid and I'm kind of shaky about sharing my faith with somebody, I have to remember this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. For in it... Verse 17, that's verse 16. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's based on a passage from Habakkuk in the Old Testament, I believe it is. The just, that's you and I, just means that when we were saved, when we were forgiven of our sins, we were justified in the sight of Almighty God. So his justice against our sin was satisfied at Jesus' cross. Yes, amen. And so the just, those of us that have been justified, have been declared, if you will, not guilty. We live by faith. And it says, from faith to faith. I think that means our faith grows. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. As we grow in our faith, the just shall live by faith. Our faith will get stronger. It'll get deeper. And because of that, we'll be stronger as we walk with Jesus. Amen. Not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek or the non-believer uh, or non-Jew. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. I love that. Uh, We want to take communion. I'm not going to get in the remainder of the chapter right now. There's so much in the latter part of this chapter I really want to dissect, take some time with it. So when I'm back in this pulpit, however long that is, I don't know. Uh, Jeremy will be here next Sunday. He's preparing a topical. And uh, I've asked him successive Sundays, if, if there is that, to do that. And that the guys that I have teach for me, I try to rotate them. But Stephen uh, leads on Friday nights, and Ray will be taking over Wednesday nights for me over in the fellowship hall. So we're covered there. And, uh, but I'm anxious to get back to Romans. I love this book. Amen. And so uh, I'm hoping I won't miss too many Sundays, but I'm not, I'm not worried at all about the guys. You know, they're going to they're gonna do a great job uh, because they love Jesus, and they want to be faithful to his word. Amen. Let's let's pray, and uh, then I'll go to the table, and we'll uh, we'll take communion together. Father, we thank you for this great book. And uh, I read somewhere else where if this is all we had of the Bible, it would be sufficient to get us from now into eternity. And I do believe that. I believe there's so much here in the 16 chapters of the book of Romans. God mentioned over 450 times more than any other topic in the book of Romans. Focus solely on you, Heavenly Father. 
thank you and your son Jesus, of course, because he reflects you to the world. So, Lord, we thank you that we got a jump start on this, this book now and that in your timing, we'll be back into it together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It's written. Lord, help me come to the end of myself where all that is left is you. And boy, that is so true because before Jesus in our lives, we are into us. We are into us. Uh, one pastor challenged us one time in this sanctuary years ago. He says, think it through in any given day how often you think of yourself as opposed to someone else. And I thought, oh, I'm a selfish guy. And still can be because we have that sin nature, amen? But we don't have to dwell there. We have... We have overcome through Jesus, and we continue to overcome as we walk with him by faith, confessing our sins. Amen. The Apostle Paul says in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you want to turn there. He says, I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. So Jesus told him, as he taught him in the deserts of Arabia, as recorded in Galatians chapters 1 and 2, what had happened that night at the Lord's Supper. Paul wasn't there. But it's as if he was there because Jesus taught him about that. He said, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. The same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, verse 25, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant, the new agreement in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And like I say every time I read that, I, I just love that. Because when we do this, it's, it's kind of reminding us he's coming for us again. Uh, he not just le- he's not just abandoning us to this crazy world that we're living in. He's coming again for us. That's a promise. Could happen any day, by the way. Any day. In light of what's going on in our world, I, I don't know if you and I are fed up with some of the decisions that are being made, not just in America, but worldwide, how much more is Jesus upset about this stuff? It's his world. Yes. Temporarily taken over by Satan because of human sin. We had the responsibility through Adam and Eve to manage this planet, but we forfeited that management over to Satan. And God allowed that, and he's allowed it up to this point. In the middle of all that, he saved us out of our, our, our craziness. And so we can, we can uh, look beyond uh, the present situation. Vote yes, but look beyond it. Amen? Amen. So be, before we take of the bread and the grape juice, let's, let's pray. Let's just go to prayer. And uh, if there's anything we need to confess, it's a time for it. And First John 1, 9, that verse up there, right above my head here. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And uh, I pointed this out, I think, Wednesday night, but it says, He's faithful and just. I think and just there means it's okay for Him to forgive our sins. That's crazy from a human standpoint. Because if we're honest, we know how nasty we can be in our sin nature. But it's okay for God to say, not guilty. Because Jesus took it all upon himself on the cross. All that shame, all that anger that you have, that God has against our sin, was taken by Jesus on the cross. Lifted off off of us onto him. That the whole of our, 
our problem was nailed to his cross. Thank you for that. So let's just go to prayer individually and then I'll sum up and then we'll take. Father, we thank you that you made provision for us even as we walk with you now. And we're saved. We, we accept that. We know we're on our way to heaven. But Lord, we mess up. And we're in need of ongoing confession. When we sin, Lord, our fellowship temporarily is broken with you, but our relationship is not. But Father, we never want to interfere with that relationship, so... We implement 1 John 1, 9. And so we, we walk in fellowship as well in relationship with him through the implementation of 1 John 1, 9. Thank you for that provision, Lord. We can have that assurance of our ongoing salvation because even though we blow it, we know that when we come back and confess, we're agreeing with you, Lord, that it's already been taken care of at the cross. We just need to confess that. Thank you that you made that provision. Because we don't have to try to keep the Ten Commandments on our own. Jesus took them for us. But Lord, we can, we can live up to the Ten Commandments as we walk by faith and we're submitted to the Holy Spirit. We fulfill the law, it says. We fulfill the requirements of the law. Thank you for that. May we really understand that and implement that in our lives on a consistent basis. And now, Father, as we begin to take the elements, we take the bread, <laughs> let's take the wafer together, representative of the body of Jesus. You know, he, uh, he offered himself up, the entirety of his being on the cross, knowing that what he was going to face, and he did it because he loved us so much. And he did it because he loved his Father so much, because it was God's will for him to go through that. Father, we thank you for what this wafer represents, the body of Jesus, his, his total sacrifice on our behalf, and according to your will, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take. One of those songs we sang had a lyric in it. I said it's Colossians chapter 3, it's Colossians chapter 2 says, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all, all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements as against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Amen to that. Amen. And uh, so we need to really believe it. The lyric says, He's taken our sins not in part, but the whole, all of them. Nothing left out. And so then, uh, 
He took the cup after supper, it says, back in 1 Corinthians 11. And uh, again, he prayed over it and he says, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Uh, do this in remembrance of me. Both the, the wafer and that which represents the blood, the grape juice, uh, are symbols of what he accomplished on the cross. And so we take the grape juice and it's unfermented. There was no corruption in him. So three days in the grave, his body didn't even begin to decay. And so we use grape juice because of that. So Father, we thank you for what this grape juice represents, the pure blood of Jesus who never sinned. He willfully never sinned. He made a decision not to. Thank you for that, Lord, because it's through him that we can be declared not guilty. So thankful, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name, as we take together now. Amen. Okay, please stand as we sing this last song.